Hello everybody. Um, so today we're going to talk about coding the bisection method. I was going to include this piece with the actual lecture on bisection method, uh, i.e. lecture 8, the last one, and then thought to myself that, well, that lecture was getting long enough, and this is different enough in its feel, and maybe it would be useful for you to have uh, a lecture on this uh, as it is. So there are a few things I want to let you know about coding uh, through this semester. Um, there are some algorithms that are super, super easy. We've already seen some of them. You've had a lab assignment in one of them um, already. So some of that code is fairly straightforward to figure out. Some of it is less straightforward. And there are certain tricks and, and, and tips that I can give you uh, to put together some of the more complicated algorithms. I'm going to be presenting them to you, these algorithms, for different methods through the course in different ways. I'll provide little tips for you to start with. I'll, I will often provide flowcharts to kind of explain the logic and to get your mind to think in the sort of right, like what's going on here with this in terms of the logical flow of whatever the algorithm is. And in certain cases, I will provide you with source code, which is what I'm going to do for the bisection method, but then it'll be up to you to adapt that code and do different things with it for the other kinds of root finding methods that we'll deal with uh, in the next couple of lectures. So um, let's get started with this. As I said, not the longest, not the longest lecture today, but we're going to think about coding the bisection method. And coding the bisection method is going to come with the need for a few um, particular ingredients, the different sorts of pieces. So we have a function. We're, we're given that this function has to be continuous in order to satisfy the you know, hypotheses of intermediate value theorem and, and so on. Um, but thinking of how to apply this method, we need some sort of initial interval. We need to know what the function is. We need that initial interval. So that's that's kind of where these uh, these first pieces are. That interval is going to be defined by the starting values a and b. So these need to be designated at the start of the code. Okay, there are a few different ways that you'll be able to evaluate a function. And you want to be able to do this repeatedly. As we saw, right, it took us a little bit of like tedious work to do bisection method for a few iterations. Um, it's nice to be able to have some method to do that uh, using a computer. The symbolic package in the sims command gives us a way of doing this in MATLAB, but there may be a few different ways to do that. So feel free to do some research um, if you don't particularly love this method, but this is what I will be using uh, for my code that I've prepared. Okay, we want to repeat something again and again and again. That sounds a whole lot like a, a loop. So you're going to have some sort of main loop. And of course, we've kind of mentioned this before, but a for loop or a while loop. I think that my code uses uh, a for loop, but you can use whichever you want. There are lots of ways to build this. And I want to make sure that you know that as well. Uh, that there may be many different possibilities for how you put things together that still go through the same sort of logical flow. Um, each time we go through it, we know the intervals need to decrease in size. So we will need to redefine either A or B at the end of every pass through that loop. Imagine that first interval is our A to B, and then the next time we're going to be replacing one of those endpoints with something that's, well, half the distance away. So we're going to have to make a new B or a new A one way or the other, depending on a certain something. Basically, whether the function evaluated at the midpoint is the same sign as or the opposite sign as. And that sounds a whole lot like a conditional. That sounds a whole lot like a conditional because it depends on, right, how f of A and how the f of B compare to f at that midpoint. So we need some sort of an if statement to deal with that. Okay, that is actually a little bit creative and I'm gonna show you exactly what I use in my code to make things pretty efficient. Um, but let's go through a bit of a flow chart to kind of summarize how this works. So this is gonna put out all of the different steps. Here's our first step right up here. <clears throat> I've defined here, sorry, sorry. First step is right here. Um, I've included in small text some little details, like if we're counting um, to try and put a bound on the error and so on, it's nice to have some sort of 
um, you know, this n equals one business and so on, to say like, oh, this is our first interval a to b, and based on how many iterations we do, we get to a certain number of intervals that then helps us to bound the error, that sort of thing. So, okay, let's see what we want to do. We start with our a, b, and f, and we flow forward along the flowchart, and we define some sort of midpoint. Okay, we're flowing this way. Okay, there's always the off chance, the like crazy little chance that we should check for it to see if f of c is equal to zero. Because if it is, that means the midpoint is right on the root and we're good to go. We figured it out. We've, we've solved the problem. We've found a root. So that's a very unlikely thing. I'm going to outline that in red. I know I detailed that in the last lecture, but yes, I'm going to say that this is unlikely. And I said down here in this bubble, don't count on this happening much because, I mean, the chances of that happening are infinitesimal. Um, but it's possible. It's possible. Okay. In that case, you would terminate the program. But if it's not, then we know that f of c is going to be either positive or negative. And we're going to want to redefine either f of a or, or, or sorry, rather, uh, we want to redefine either a or b to be something new depending on what the result is. So, um, there's a question though. Algorithmically, you don't want to keep doing this forever. Maybe you make a decision at some point under some criteria. Under some criteria, for example, the number of iterations. Perhaps you've done this like 20 times or 50 times or whatever and you and you're pretty sure that you're extremely close to a root of this thing maybe you make a decision to stop so that would represent the end of the loop in that case so keep going no ends the process keep going yes is going to then continue by doing that redefinition which which of a and b are going to be redefined to be the endpoint that's going to give us a new interval okay we want to say if f of a is the opposite sign of f of b, then we'll redefine the b to be the c, and vice versa, if f of b is the opposite sign of f of c, redefine the a to be the c. That ensures that our new interval is going to bracket the root, that it's going to be on, um, it's going to contain it, right? So this is going to, this is going to ensure, ensures that the new interval brackets a root. Remember I say a root because in general we cannot, like that last demonstration from the previous lecture, there is the possibility that we have multiple roots to worry about um, in a particular interval, but we're going to converge on one of them at least. So at this point, when you redefine the interval, we have now completed an iteration, so you would increase the n by 1, and you start over again. You keep going along the circle until you're sick of it until you've, you've reached some sort of ending criteria, whatever that might be. Um, yeah, so that's that's kind of the bisection method in terms of a flow chart, and it's important for you to understand this. One thing that you might consider doing for practice is to stop right here, go to MATLAB, try to program something that does this. And then once you've done that, you might consider looking at my source code, which we're going to go through next, and see how it compares. It's really kind of powerful to be able to put together something like this. I think mine takes about, I forget, 20 lines or something. Um, and be able to come to uh, an answer for these sorts of uh, these functions and finding roots. It's a really cool thing to do. So let's see. Uh, at the end of the day, oh yeah, there's a certain error. That's the error bound that we talked about from the last class. Okay, so I said since this is our first real algorithm, <laughs> here's some code that might help you see how this flowchart works in practice. Okay, um, I'm not going to provide you with source code for every single um, every single uh, uh, algorithm that we do this semester, but I think it's really important to be able to see it at least once um, for root finding methods so you get an idea of how it looks in terms of code. So I'm going to go through this, and um, that should get you off to a really good start when it comes to this method, and when it comes to uh, the other methods that are coming up, which are false position, secant method, Newton's method, uh, which will be in the next few lectures. So uh, let's see, what do we have here? We have, uh, here's the definition of our first interval. 
So definition of our first interval, there's a and b. Okay, it looks like we've declared a symbolic variable. I want to say there are some students that were uh, that were having a little bit of trouble with errors being produced by symbolic uh, variables and so on. And one thing you might consider is depending on how your your um, code is is written, some students have found success in including a sims f of x as well. So I'm gonna I'm gonna write that down as uh, a little bracket here. Try also using uh, I'm gonna say try additionally because it would be in addition to the x. Try additionally using uh, sims f of x after this line in case you're getting errors. This isn't happening with many people, but there are a few errors with uh, assigning uh, functions and so on using symbolics, and this seems to be helping some people, okay? Um, in any case, whether you need this piece or not, get your function defined and here it looks like we're going to be applying this method to e to the minus x minus x which is one of the examples that we did back in the last lecture so our main loop is as follows here we've made a choice to just run this algorithm 10 times so this algorithm will pass through 10 times All right, sounds good, sounds good. And here are the different pieces. I've tried to comment here to make it very clear, but everything seems like it should be straightforward, right? There's the definition of the C, finding the current midpoint. That's what this is. So we're just finding C relative to our current values of A and B, just averaging the two together. And then here is that um, set of if statements. We're gonna check to see if we've discovered the root, if f of c is equal to zero, remember double equals is the check for um, if two things are equal to one another. A single equals won't cut it because a single equals is used to try and define a new variable. So don't use single equals, double equals when checking. Um, and note that if it's zero, I just break us right out of the loop using this uh, structure. That's not the only structure that you could use, but that's what I've used here. Now, this is the kind of cool part. The other thing is to say, we want to know if f of a is the opposite sign of f of c, right? If the left endpoint has a height that's the opposite sign of the midpoint, or if it's f of b that's the opposite sign of f of c. So one of those has to be true as we spoke about in the last lecture. And here's the quickest way of doing it. If f of a times f of c is less than zero. Let's think about that for a second f of a and f of c, if they are opposite signs, their product will always be negative. And this statement will be true. Pretty cool, eh? And if that's not true, then it must be the case that it's f of b times f of c that's less than zero. So, um, I mean, I wrote it right here. So I'm going to say a product is always less than zero if the two, the, two, uh, the two factors are opposite signs. And so that serves as a really quick one line check instead of like a series of if statements, that sort of thing. And then we redefine the, uh, the B and the C, uh, or the B and the A, depending on which, which of those things is true. And then we just repeat that process again and again for as many times as you want, as I said, 10 times here, you could go further if you wanted to. Um, there are different ways, different sorts of ending criteria that you could use. So, um, yeah, uh, in summary, this whole thing can be executed in under 20 lines of code. You can absolutely try to program it yourself without looking at this page. I totally recommend that. Um, you've got a couple of tips now that you could use. But uh, yeah, be creative, try to apply your code in, uh, in different ways to different functions using different uh, um, 
uh, kinds of initial intervals. And uh, don't be afraid to play around with it. Because the more you play around with it, the more comfortable you'll get with that programming aspect that a lot of people uh, kind of start out with a little bit of hesitance uh, uh, regarding, you know? And once you get your feet wet, I think it gets better. That's certainly what my experience was. So that's the bisection method in terms of MATLAB code. So give that a shot when you get the chance. There's a little bit of a uh, for you to try, for you to try. Um, and in the next few lectures, we're going to talk about some uh, innovations on that technique, some, some other root finding methods that get increasingly more sophisticated. We're going to have lectures with regards to uh, a method called false position, which is sort of a, a souped up version of bisection method. And then Seagate method, Newton's method, which are more efficient, kind of a, a, a gold standard of, of root finding in some sort of sense. Uh, in comparison to bisection method. They're they're faster, they're more sophisticated, but there are some uh, cautionary tales regarding those methods. So I hope you'll join me then. Uh, until then, take care of yourselves.